name is Jonathan. Um, I'm, I guess, what you consider a uh, data transitioner. Uh, I had a graduate uh, background from uh, STEM from uh, UC Davis, but uh, I got very interested in uh, data and I saw just the potential for the tools there. They're pretty amazing. So, for the past uh, year and a half, I've been uh, just diving in and just exploring uh, those tools. And so, I want to talk to you about web scraping, which is uh, something that I've had to deal with uh, a little bit to start my own projects. Um, because in data science, uh, to work with data, you know, first you need to have it. Um, it's not always there. It's not always packaged nicely in CSV files or tables or databases. Sometimes you have to go out there and get it. Uh, and so when you have to do that, you have to resort to web scraping. So it's just the context of the talk, but I guess the my intentions with the talk and goals are to, you know, I can't teach you these things if that's uh, if, if you're new to this, but I can point you to tutorials and give you the insight and convey the difficulty of pain points uh, that I had to go through when learning these tools myself. And maybe some concepts so that when you go out to the tutorials, and there's so many resources online to learn any of these things in this space, um, that you'll learn them faster, faster than I did. And I'm still learning. I'm not by any means an expert professional in this. Um, so what is web scraping and why do it? Well, there's so much data out there on the web. Uh, you might have user comments, you might get a sense of like the sentiment of products, uh, product reviews. If you're selling stuff, you want to know your competitors' prices. Um, you want to keep track of things like the weather or stock market prices. Uh, you want to keep track of that in real time. Uh, so you have to go to a website and then I don't know, find the numbers or whatever that you care about. You might want to scrape images or something. Uh, or job descriptions, if you're uh, you taking an approach to the job on uh, the clever way. Um, so to get this information, they have different ways. Uh, sometimes websites provide their own methods, like their own ways to interact with the websites, called APIs, application program interfaces. Um, but there's limitations with that. Like that's the usually the easier way, but to get the info at a, like enough of a rate, that might not be enough of what you want. Other times they, they limit it. Um, other times they don't even have one. So in those cases, you need to get your own um, way to find it. And Python is the tool set that I've used. Uh, it's a wonderful language, very easy to learn. Um, yeah, so I'm assuming you have some familiarity with it, but if not, it's just an easy thing to pick up. There's so many nice resources out there. Uh, yeah, so web scraping is the automatic way of doing this. You're not doing it manually, you're not copying the numbers visually or like writing it down. And when you can automate something, you can scale it up and just get a lot of data. And companies with lots of data usually point out, you know, for better models or whatever. So if you have better data, it's probably going to put you in a good position. You can do fun things with it. Um, just to give you an overall big picture of how to view this task, uh, that I don't know, helps you to understand some of the tools out there because how those tools view them too. Um, the first thing you have to do is decide what information you want out there on any website. So that involves like knowing what product you want to do, what you're curious about, uh, looking at the website, what information might be useful to you, uh, and then just yeah, just uh, knowing what your personal interest is. In it. The rest of the steps are tool-based. Um, they have to do with Python. And one of them is creating a list of the websites you're going to target. Like it's pretty important because of something called scrapey, like or beautiful soup. You have to make your own list or feed it in, and that's just a useful, organized way to approach the problem. But once you have this list, which means like uh, you know specialized pages on one set of pages, uh, once you have that list, then your task is to use the tools. There's so many different commands in each to get the data from each site. And that involves going under the hood and seeing what's going on in there. But at the same time, as a website, like as the tools are reading each page, you also have to store that. And so sometimes you have to come up with your own ways, like dealing with databases, or finding out how your tool outputs it in a nice format you care about. Whether it's a Python data structure or uh, an Excel file or something like that, a CSV. So those are the things to keep in mind, because if you have this in picture, you can see what the framework specifics are afterwards, or what the tool sets tutorials tell you. 
Okay, so just a bit what you need to do this. Um, my specific path for this is, uh, well, when I looked at this, I had to understand HTML, just what a web page, how to think about it. And the best, the most basic concept, or the most important concept that I came across was that you could look at it in what we call like a tree structure. You know, that's uh, just like a family tree with uh, parents and children, cousins, etc., siblings, that relationship. That's the best way to view a web page because that's how the tools treat it. And so if you know how to navigate through that family tree or the web tree, you can get to what you want. So each uh, tool set has its own different way of navigating the tree. Um, it's called the document object model, but it's just a tree that you can go through. And it's important to know the names of things that you're looking for because the tools have commands that talk about it. So I'll share that with you when I learn. Um, the next thing to actually go through the structure, like I said, um, you'll have to know strategies about well, filtering the different children or what the website is made of, what the, the tags are, you know, what HTML is. And there are different ways of, of doing that. So there's stuff that has nothing to do with programming tools. There's like uh, just HTML and XPath, like those are independent of the tools you use. And then there's Python specific tools, which I use. So these first things are ways to ref reference parts of your web page independent of Python. The rest are tools within Python. And if you have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to, to interrupt and ask. Okay, so here is a, here's a sample web page I took from a scraping tutorial. Um, so this is you know, what HTML looks like. If you go to View Source, if you have a laptop out right now, you can go to any website. I guess press control U or view source, and you will see that this is what's behind the output. Right? So the web page reads this and, and spits out you know, pretty uh, front. Our job is to, to look at this and realize that at some level it looks like this. It's a tree because the relationship is that tags, over here we have tags open and closed like HTML. Things that are within tags are the children of the, the outside tags. So it's an inside-outside relationship, outside-inside. Um, and that's the, the ancestor, parent-child. And you can use the indentation level, you know, what's aligned to the left as like what's the parent, and anything at the same level are siblings, um, so on and so forth. So that's how you navigate, you know, what's immediately under and between, and then go through that. So that's the way to do this as a tree, tags are the tags. Now, as far as what things are called, that's pretty important too, because in this tree you have to refer to things. Um, so there might be parent-child relationships, literally in Beautiful Soup they have that, um, those words. But uh, in Selenium, I think there's this word element. So even though I showed you tags as part of a tree, there's more general things that you can say are children within each other, like attributes within a tag or something. So, just to be clear, like an element is, I guess, a pair of open and closed tags, like this A tag, and everything in between. Now within that element, there's uh, attributes, like properties of the tag that you define in certain values. This is important to know because this is a way to filter that. Because this is like an HTML, like the, the blue things that you click, um, that's what they are. So this href tells you like where you're going to go, what web page, and the text that you might actually be after is in between. So the text itself is another part of the node, it's something you can search in those commands. It's something that you might want to because that is probably the data that you're after. Um, but once you know this, you can navigate the commands of your tool and then you know, go accordingly. So I've referenced like a lot of these tools. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you the ones that I specifically use that I've found to be the most powerful and useful and probably your, you know, what you'll eventually use um, as compared to what you might use in the beginning if you try this out. Uh, so again, you have to hop onto these nodes of the tree, so you know, members of the tree, like the parents, I guess, um, relatively. Uh, and one of them is this language called XPath. And basically, it's like uh, folders searching sort of in advanced. Um, for those of you who have laptops out and want to do something, 
you can just Google scrape the XPath tutorial and it'll give you that tree structure I showed, but you'll have something you can type in like live right now and try that. So that's something to do. And you can you know, talk to me afterwards if you have questions on this. But this is pretty interactive, it's fast, it's fast, and it's a good way to, to run this. And I'll tell you why uh, I choose XPath in particular. It's just very easy. Um, and I'll show you later like, how it compares with other things. Uh, the other way is if you're not using this specific thing, like uh, Beautiful Soup, another tool that I've used is, it's basically your, how to find a tag that you want is like going through all of them. So the other way is, okay, so let's talk about XPath first. To get to this, it's just uh, finding who's, you know, go to this, you go to the body because you see that it's underneath this div tag, this div tag, this paragraph tag, this A tag. You can see how like each of these does it, like where the full path is given here. What XPath is really good for is it looks at like parts of the tree that kind of match the relative structure. This is the full thing with uh, direct path, meaning everything I said. But you can search all folders that kind of have this relationship. You can just lop off like parts of that with the double slashes, and that's very powerful because it filters by structure, which the other ways don't really do. Um, and there's numbering there, which is pretty useful because you can replace the numbers with an asterisk and everything on that page with, with that. Not just the second one, but the third and the fourth or whatever. You get that. So that's very, very powerful. It's like that wild card. Uh, thing. So that's why my bias is towards this because I, I think objectively it's more powerful and specific because of the structural filter. Um, for alternate methods, it's like the brute force way, the beautiful suit. For example, it's like you create a list or an iterator of things like all the A tags, and then you hope that one of them has the specific thing that you want. You can filter it by whatever the link that it goes to is, like what it starts with. And so for extra filtering, you'll need something called regular expressions, which parse text in like specific ways, like, oh, it starts with uh, AF or something, or you know, something random. Or it starts with a four-digit number, it has a slash, things are the bread and butter techniques to filter. So you can either filter by the text or filter by the structure. And this is often like pretty easy. Um, and I, the reason I say it's easy is because, let's see what's next. Yeah, the, the reason I say it's easy is because you can get to um, any website and I'm just try it out here right now, but you can right click on any part of it and uh, there will be an option that says inspect, at least on Chrome. And if you look at that, it'll open up like the structure behind the scenes on your web browser. You know, I should show this, but it will have a, an option to copy the XPath. So the stuff I've shown you, you don't even have to know that. You can just right click the thing that you want, aim for it, right click, and right click it again on the actual structure of the web page that shows up, and then get the address. So Yes. Sorry, going back to the, the um, slide before that, is the yeah. idea that there are a whole bunch of web pages that all have this structure and you want that same A tag from all of those different web pages? The idea is that under one website, there are different web pages, yet yeah, hopefully have a uniform structure, some pattern that you can go to. It's a general one. It might not have to be the exact same thing, but uh, yeah, and hopefully this kind of structuring is uniform enough so that you can get it. Right, and so you want to find the, the general structure for mm -hmm. all of the pages that are looking for, the one specific yeah. data on one specific page. Right, right. So, yeah, your, your setup is, your problem generally is defined as, okay, you have one thing on one page, and there's going to be a page exactly like it, but for another thing, like a product or something, so the reviews might be under the same section. Mm -hmm. And you would think that the structures of pages are the same because it's easy to copy and paste them. So there should be some pattern. Otherwise, randomness is, yeah, it's uh, but you can still get around all that too. Um, so yeah, you're assuming a similar structure. And that's why it's up to you to do the right clicking, to do the, the viewing to, for your target size to see which ones are the same. So yeah, that can be a very, that can be a, a long pain point if you're doing the alternate method. If it's not the same, you have to hunt it all at once to think of the generalized pattern. So that can be, time-consuming part. Um, okay, so 
I guess let's talk about the tools that you'll use. You know, there's a lot of things out there, but their use cases are, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention one. So Beautiful Soup is what I started out with. Um, it just takes in that whole page and you can search and hop along that tree. Uh, it's very easy to learn and that's why people start off with it. The, the drawback is it's slow. The next thing that I tried to use is, let me check the out, is, well, after that, because it's slow, you might pick up something called multi-threading, um, just a way to spread out the tasks, um, and that's tricky. But then Scrapey is something that's really fast and has all this stuff structured for you, and you just have to know how to set things up. But that could be a new Python-specific thing, dealing with classes or things. And I'll show you some examples like that. Then finally, when your websites are just so complicated, which I find that most of them are, you're going to want a web browser to like to automatically do the thing that you would do as a human, to right-click this, uh, to input this, and save this link, or save this. And that's what Selenium is for. When things get too hard, you go use this. And you can use Selenium within Scrape Your Beautiful Soup. It's kind of like its own specific thing. So there's combinations that are not just usually exclusive. I think you can use beautiful soup and scrapey, but I don't see the point. These two, use one or the other. And selenium, you can use an item. I think that might be most of what's on these slides, but I haven't. Yeah, so this is also. Um, so not every website wants you to uh, get too much info out of it um, because they like to keep some of their info for themselves, or they can't handle the traffic. These things are so fast, they send out requests to get the information from the website, but because you can automate it, it does it so fast and so frequently, you have to send it a timer or just pull back and hit it, that otherwise you'll crash it. So they might ban you if you overburden them, or it's just, it's just not good. So they usually have a robots file, or a .text file, that uh, tells you what they want you to see or not. Sometimes they get what you want, you have to ignore that, but you don't want to crash it draw attention either. Um, so you have to scrape responsibly. And there might be privacy issues with scraping things like Facebook or user info, you know, so you might violate the user agreement. So that's important to look up if you're worried that your, your use is, is uh, yeah, not good. Um, so just be careful. So those are the, yeah, that's all I wanted to show with PowerPoint. And the rest, I think, would be uh, Jupyter Notebook. I'll, uh, it's like a live demo of some of this stuff. Yeah, so when you're looking at this, I want you to uh, look at like what uh, the spider framework is. We'll compare and contrast the things like, uh, and show what Selenium can do. Dictionary, 
And that's, that's what I filtered for while looking at the website myself to see if I have that. Um, maybe I should go to the website myself. Yeah, so we'll just be going to like this. Right, so this is the page, but then underneath it is all the HTML. So to find all this, now this is called a static page because everything's there. You don't have to interact with the page to get new content. And so if you wanted to search for the, the name Afghanistan, So you would filter it and you'd see that, oh, this is the pattern. It's like all there. So that's what you might have to do if you're gonna if you're gonna go through the page of HTML yourself and find that like control F the, the text that you're looking for. So that can be tedious in itself, but if it's there, it's simple and straightforward. So so that's what this is. Loading some things to make this faster. Um, Pandas uh, is just a nice way to view things, you know, data analysis. There's things you might see. And uh, yeah, so what I'm comparing is beautiful soup by itself, uh, speeding up with multi threading, and then scrapey. I'll show you some of later. But, okay, so right now, this is the speed at which it's going through that list that uh, I created and going to each country name and uh, getting it. This might take like two minutes or something, so I'm sorry if I, it's boring. But, um, but yeah, you see the pace, right? So while this is going on, we can talk about multi-threading and how that's different. So this is going and waiting for each... Uh, <laughs> you can stop now. I need it for the, the time, though, but... Uh, oh, okay. But this thing... You have a way of uh, so this notebook is wonderful because it uh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> okay, so this next setup is you have to do a bunch of things to understand how multi-threading works, and it's some work and a lot of YouTubing and uh, a lot of troubleshooting because you have to understand that as you split the attention um, for this, you don't want your your computer to wait for the task at hand to finish. You're going to switch while it's waiting for the input output of the website. It's going to do other things. And that's why this one is faster. But it takes some, you know, some expertise with programming and troubleshooting and like figuring out what Python does differently from general cases. Or so there might be issues like that. So, but the point is a speed up. Um, yeah. So let's take some time. Let's see where we're at. It's alphabetical. Um, just by a show of hands, uh, how many of you have played with Python or programming? Um, so, have you tried web scraping? Yeah. I do have a quick question. Yes. Are you able to make this available online? Because I would love to be able to learn. Yeah, it's, uh, there's nothing in here that's, uh, yeah, yep. Uh, I, we, put out, we can put it on Slack. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can put it on GitHub and then just yeah, sure. share it with that. Uh, Go ahead, yeah. I'll Yeah. Okay, so that one's done. That's with the sort of time. Now, this one, it's the same thing, but uh, it's a little faster, right? So. Yeah, and one thing is there might be some places like that are not in alphabetic order because multi-threading is weird like that. It doesn't output the same. It's out of sync. Uh, so that's something. That's four threads. Yeah. <clears throat> How do the threads know like not to go all get the same tag? I think I don't know what I'm. 
know that Python allows, so it depends on what the language allows, like access to all at once. I know for writing to a sort of data structure, not about printing. I think printing, it's just everything's out there, so there's no, it can be simultaneous. But for writing to a data structure, I think Python only allows one at a time. And there's computer primitive structures that, this is all computer science stuff that I'm not, I looked up stuff, but uh, I'm not an expert in that. But they limit what has access, what thread has access to, or what, they limit the access of information. So some things only talk to one thing at a time. Um, so there's ways of doing that. And I think Python data structures are only write one thing at a time. So the printing is, is there. So that's, I don't know if that would, yeah, um, I can't, I can't tell like why, I guess for the structures that I would put that in, like I, order wouldn't matter because in a dictionary, there's no such thing as alphabetical order. Uh, so it wouldn't show up, but yeah, for writing, that wouldn't matter. For printing, it's a little disconcerting. Uh, let's see if we're done. Is the, the part that's actually <clears throat> multi threaded? I don't think you went through it fairly fast, but where's the, where's the part that tells it to do the four threads? Right here. Um, so is each thread being told what site to go to when it's launched to the worker itself? Yeah, well, so, so there's a. I guess there's a queue. Um, this might answer your question, which is thinking that the worker. The, says, oh, go to this one page and go do the work. Right, so, so there's a queue structure, right, like that has all these lists and things need to be done. Okay. Yeah, so there's a list of sites that need to be done. Okay. And then... Okay. So there's one then, task. Off, 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 see, that's the assumption. Yeah. Right, so you have to structure it like that, and these are ways to... So, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's complicated compared to just doing one at a time. But there's a speed up forward and done. You can see that even like one at a time, just getting the name, which is a simple thing, can take a while. So that's done. Uh, let's compare now with Scrape. So let's take a look at Scrape. It has, it has words like their version of multi-threading, which is asynchronous programming. So whatever, they're pros and they've got it done. It's really fast, but if you're going to use this, I just want to show that basically you have to define two things in a spider a web crawler. You have to define the sites that you're targeting, and then what to do for each site. So once you have those two, this can work. So it's like you take a tutorial, you modify it, and uh, it. And as far as what we go, we're, what we use for the XPath, uh, that's what I right clicked, you know, where I showed you that link. I just put it there, and so I didn't have to use beautiful soups uh, functions at all. So like that.
Because so you have to click that. Like if you go to the site, you have to interact with it to get that. And so anyway, just to say, yeah. So that's a that's what beautiful. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. So that's what this did. It opened up this, and then that's it. So those things. So I've never been to this website before to like see it under the hood, but I just right clicked and then I put the stuff that I want to see and figured out how so many did it and then bam, so that's website. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's all I've got. Um, yeah, any questions? Uh, we have an answer. Yes? Yeah. In terms of securing your data from your outside perspective, what's the best kind of high level concept of securing data on the site against screen? Against it, I uh, I don't know. It's a it's a battle because well, you want people to see your website. The point of it is to convey the information out there. So it's kind of don't put it out there, right? So don't have just put it in local. Don't put it on the internet if you want to secure data. Um, as far as like login. Oh, uh, yeah, logins can do that. But I mean, I use my own logins to get to like Glassdoor's job stuff. And, so you can make up one, so I don't know if that's the thing. Um, and Selenium, so yeah, the dynamic stuff, the complicated stuff filters out uh, beautiful soup and scrapey, just basic stuff. But as far as uh, making life difficult for Selenium, Selenium can just go past all that. It's just really slow, so maybe that's a defense in itself. Glassdoor, I think they limit the data that they get, like even though there's thousands of data scientists' jobs apparently, you only see a thousand because they have thirty pages the most of thirty links each. So they limit like that. So they might limit what users are allowed to see because what human would would do that? You know. So uh, so they there's limits. And then if you there's a whole battle between user agents, all these things that it's like a it's a war between two sides because they are they have things against bots and bots have things, you know, all the scrapey uh, features that I'm not talking about, that's part of that, to get around those. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you just got to keep up with the tools. Um, but I'm not part of that site, like, it's just a low scale thing that I've been doing. But if you want to scale it up, you can. And if you want to make life difficult, scrapey can do that, but don't. Um, because you probably don't want the website to crash or them to ban you. Um, but yeah, it's a demonstration of the, the tools. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Um, <clears throat> is Jupyter Notebooks the platform to like run it? Or how do you have it? Up okay, so yeah, uh, so there are wonderful tools out there. And uh, so, Ana so there's Python, the language. There's Anaconda, which is the series of libraries. I think we've written for that. And then there's uh, this integrated development environment, it's called Jupyter Notebooks, which is like the web page. You know, I can just open up a new thing and then basically modify the web page to do a new calculator part or a place to do notes, and that comes with that. Um, it comes with the Anaconda package. So it's free, just go to anaconda.com, you know, the Python one, and you'll get it. So that's how, so just download that, and, uh, just run it. So run your web browser. You can use these tools without Jupyter Notebooks? You can. You yeah, can just write base Python. Yeah, it's just it's in a bland format. It's not as interactive. So for Scrapey, I can learn how to do that in Jupyter Notebook because otherwise you're opening up like this command prompt and then typing something in. And that's fine for yourself, but if you want to demo it, you know, it's better to be all in one place. Uh, you have to restart it, the notebook, if you're using Scrapey like this. So that's the caveat, but yeah, but that's uh, yeah, that's how I understand.